This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a science student inquiring about English courses at a university language centre. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Oh. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. OK, quite a variety then. Mm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12, and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> It would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes, but we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. OK. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. Okay, 
And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. Okay. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook, as we don't provide paper or files. Okay. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a manager giving a welcome talk to a group of apprentices who are starting their training at the company. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good morning, everyone. My name's Janet Parker, and I'm the Human Resources Manager. We're very happy to welcome you to your new apprenticeship. I hope that the next six months will be a positive and enjoyable experience for you. I'd like to start with some general advice about being an apprentice. Most of you have very little or no experience of working for a big organisation, and the first week or so may be quite challenging. There will be a lot of new information to take in, but don't worry too much about trying to remember everything. The important thing is to check with someone if you're not sure what to do. You'll find your supervisor is very approachable and won't mind explaining things or helping you out. You're here to learn, so make the most of that opportunity. You'll be spending time in different departments during your first week so make an effort to talk to as many people as possible about their work. You'll make some new friends and find out lots of useful information. As well as having a supervisor, you'll each be assigned a mentor. This person will be someone who's recently completed an apprenticeship and you'll meet with them on a weekly basis. Their role is to provide help and support throughout your apprenticeship. Of course, this doesn't mean they'll actually do any of your work for you. Instead, they'll be asking you about what goals you've achieved so far, as well as helping you to identify any areas for improvement. 
You can also discuss your more long-term ambitions with them as well. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, I just want to run through a few company policies for our apprenticeship scheme with you. Most importantly, the internet. As part of your job, you'll be doing some research online, so obviously you'll have unlimited access for that. But please don't use it for personal use. You'll have your own phones for that. Some of you have already asked me about flexible working. After your probationary three-month period, some of you will be eligible for this. But it will depend on which department you're in and what your personal circumstances are. So please don't assume you'll automatically be permitted to do this. I want to make sure there's no confusion about our holiday policy. Apart from any statutory public holidays, we ask that you don't book any holidays until after your six-month apprenticeship has finished. Time off should only be taken if you are unwell. Please speak to your supervisor if this is going to be a problem. You'll be expected to work a 40-hour week, but there may be opportunities to do overtime during busy periods. Although you're not required to do this, it can be a valuable experience, so we advise you to take it up if possible. Obviously, we understand that people do have commitments outside work, so don't worry if there are times when you are unavailable. As you know, we don't have a formal dress code here. You may wear casual clothes as long as they're practical. And the only restriction for shoes we have is on high heels for health and safety reasons. Comfortable shoes like trainers are preferable. There's a heavily subsidised canteen on site where you can get hot meals or salads cheaply. Snacks and drinks are also provided, so we've decided to introduce a no-packed lunch policy. This is partly to encourage healthy eating at work and partly to stop people from eating at their workstation, which is unhygienic. OK, moving on to... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. 
I'm glad I bumped into you. Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes, yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, we could do science and ethics. Sounds quite interesting. Yes, but I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course. Mm. So, science and ethics. There's a lot of reading and research to do. And I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I see we have to do assignments and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports. You know, organizing them and using the right kind of language. Mm. Might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh. I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do. Mm -hmm. So it depends what we want to do in the future. But apparently, they send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point. Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that. Because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing. Mm. So it's got a very practical application. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 24 to 30. So, let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh, goodness. If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh, no, that's not fair. Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No. This maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. So, we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University. Oh. <laughs> Mind you, the one on this course should make sense, because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So, at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge, and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January, and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not. Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have? Like, what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, OK. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it. Huh. I think you'll be OK. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. Oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December, they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, what's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh. I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary, though. <laughs> well... 
It shouldn't be too bad, as they say that we can do it in pairs. Oh. Spread the load, as it were. <laughs> oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on, then? Let me look. Um... Ah, it says that we have an interview and we get a mark for the whole course, depending on how well we do in that. Oh, right. OK. So I... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about a way of reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. As we saw in the last lecture, a major cause of climate change is the rapid rise in the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last century. If we could reduce the amount of CO2, perhaps the rate of climate change could also be slowed down. One potential method involves enhancing the role of the soil that plants grow in with regard to absorbing CO2. Ratan Lal, a soil scientist from Ohio State University in the USA, claims that the world's agricultural soils could potentially absorb 13% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the equivalent of the amount released in the last 30 years and research is going on into how this might be achieved. Lau first came to the idea that soil might be valuable in this way, not through an interest in climate change, but rather out of concern for the land itself and the people dependent on it. Carbon-rich soil is dark, crumbly and fertile, and retains some water. But erosion can occur if soil is dry, which is a likely effect if it contains inadequate amounts of carbon. Erosion is of course bad for people trying to grow crops or breed animals on that terrain. In the 1970s and 80s, Lau was studying soils in Africa so devoid of organic matter that the ground had become extremely hard, like cement. There he met a pioneer in the study of global warming who suggested that carbon from the soil had moved into the atmosphere. This is now looking increasingly likely. 
Let me explain. For millions of years, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been regulated, in part, by a natural partnership between plants and microbes, tiny organisms in the soil. Plants absorb CO2 from the air and transform it into sugars and other carbon-based substances. While a proportion of these carbon products remain in the plant, some transfer from the roots to fungi and soil microbes, which store the carbon in the soil. The invention of agriculture some 10,000 years ago disrupted these ancient soil-building processes and led to the loss of carbon from the soil. When humans started draining the natural topsoil and ploughing it up for planting, they exposed the buried carbon to oxygen. This created carbon dioxide and released it into the air. And in some places, grazing by domesticated animals has removed all vegetation, releasing carbon into the air. Tons of carbon have been stripped from the world's soils where it's needed and pumped into the atmosphere. So, what can be done? Researchers are now coming up with evidence that even modest changes to farming can significantly help to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Some growers have already started using an approach known as regenerative agriculture. This aims to boost the fertility of soil and keep it moist through established practices. These include keeping fields planted all year round and increasing the variety of plants being grown. Strategies like these can significantly increase the amount of carbon stored in the soil, so agricultural researchers are now building a case for their use in combating climate change. One American investigation into the potential for storing CO2 on agricultural lands is taking place in California. Soil scientist Wendy Silver of the University of California, Berkeley, is conducting a first-of-its-kind study on a large cattle farm in the state. She and her students are testing the effects on carbon storage of the compost that is created from waste, both agricultural, including manure and corn stalks, and waste produced in gardens, such as leaves, branches and lawn trimmings. In Australia, soil ecologist Christine Jones is testing another promising soil enrichment strategy. Jones and 12 farmers are working to build up soil carbon by cultivating grasses that stay green all year round. Like composting, the approach has already been proved experimentally. Jones now hopes to show that it can be applied on working farms and that the resulting carbon capture can be accurately measured. It's hoped in the future that projects such as these will demonstrate the role that farmers and other land managers can play in reducing the harmful effects of greenhouse gases. For example, in countries like the United States, where most farming operations use large applications of fertiliser, changing such long-standing habits will require a change of system. Ratan Lal argues that farmers should receive payment, not just for the corn or beef they produce, but also for the carbon they can store in their soil. Another study being carried out... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.